Okay, well, thank you again for being here. A few quick announcements before we bring Dr. Sutton up. You know, the, uh, the last Saturday of each month is testimony night, and we feed you a meal. Sometimes we feed you in between, but that's a guaranteed meal, so don't miss that. We've got a good one coming in. Uh, Tim Lewick is coming all the way in from the north side of Orlando to come talk to us here. So uh, be here for that. It's awesome. That is the last Saturday of the month. Uh, before that, we've got Pastor Stewart coming next week to talk on relationships. I have no idea what that is, but he did tell me it's not what I think it is. So whatever that means, I trust him to bring a good message. Um, and then after that, I am, think I'm, I'm praying about it, but I think I'm going to go into a series on the Christian roots of the 12 steps. I teach that uh, uh, in a very abbreviated form at the uh, Recovery Church retreats. And uh, by the way, we have one of those coming up. Um, you guys know the word raha or moro? Those are Greek words for fool. So that'll help you remember that this year the retreat is being held April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd uh, right over in Lake Placid. So if you'd like to join us there, uh, it's a great time of good learning and fellowship. Uh, and please consider that. You can go to the Recovery Church Movement website and sign up for those retreats. Uh, they do have couples cabins, which I will tell you if you're a couple, those go quick. Uh, so if you want to go as a couple, sign up now. And if you do, there's a uh, discount, uh, early bird discount. Guess what the code word is? Early bird, one word. So, so uh, do that uh, if you'd like to be a part of that. Um, what else do I have? Oh, uh, we're going to uh, pass a plate around. Why do we pass a plate around? We're 100% volunteer driven. What do we need money for? Well, we use that to take Bibles out to the jail. I, I work as a counselor and chaplain out at the jail, also pro bono. But uh, we bring them life recovery Bibles out there so that they can find the freedom that we have found. Uh, and I will tell you that last week I was in talking to a, a, a gentleman there, and he told me that he had found a peace and, and a serenity and a joy that he had never known, but he only found it while locked up because the Lord spoke to his heart and he was able to access the word while he was there. So there's good stuff coming out of that. Uh, if you want to be a part of the jail ministry, let me know. We're, we're happy to tell you how that works. Uh, we also uh, bring the Bibles here. We've got another order, a few cases coming here. We're out now, so as soon as those get here, we'll have those available to anybody that doesn't have one. We also have over here some other books that are free, and so those are available to you as well. And they do, this also pays for that meal when I talked about well, it's given meals. So uh, I'm just going to do a, a quick prayer since we prayed already and then invite Dr. Sutton up. So, Lord, we do thank you. You have been so gracious to us, Lord. But we, we also now, our hearts are broken for those uh, that we've lost. There's, there's been family loss within our members here. Uh, we lost someone who had been part of our congregation and been here, uh, recently overdosed. And, Lord, so we pray for that family as well, both the recovery family and then the nuclear family. And then, Lord, this week we lost uh, two deputies in our sheriff's department. Lord, we pray for those families as they're at the graveside, probably still now. Lord, there's so much loss in our world, but there's also so much that you have to offer that is good. So we thank you, Lord, for, for your peace, for your presence, for your promises, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Sutton. All right. Sitting <laughs> in the morning sun. I'll be sitting when the evening comes, watching the ships roll in, and I watch them roll away again. Now I'm just a sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away. Oh, I am sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. Left my home in Georgia, headed for the Frisco Bay. I had nothing to live for, looked like nothing gonna come my way. Now I'm just a sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away. Yeah, I'm just a sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. Mm. I think we'll skip the whistle thing. That's just not that good. So I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of you watch football. It's kind of a football story. But So this guy died and went to heaven. 
And uh, he got up to heaven and St. Peter met him at the gate and said, you know, you live such an exemplary life. Uh, we're going to allow you one option that we don't give to most people. We're going to let you go back down and experience one thing you've never experienced. We're going to let you uh, see something you never see, hear something you never, just get a question answered that you never had answered. He said, what would you like to know? And he said, well, my big question in my whole life was, is that hell really a place of brimstone and fire and, and all of that? And he said, well, we can answer that. See that elevator right there? Get on and push the button, go all the way to the bottom. When the doors open up, you'll get to see for yourself. And then when you're done looking, push the button, it'll come back up, and then you'll have that answered. He said, okay, that's good. He got on the elevator, went all the way to the bottom. The doors opened up, and it was freezing. It was like sub-zero. Everything was solid ice, and it was blowing, and it was cold. And he stood there and shivered for a while, and he looked at it, finally pushed the button, and he went back up. He said to St. Peter, he said, well, I got there. He said, well, what do you think? He said, I'm more confused now than I was before I went. St. Peter said, well, why is that? He said, well, when we got there, as the doors opened and what I expected, you know, it was nothing like that. It was frozen solid. It was icy and it was cold and the wind was blowing. He said, I don't understand it. Can you explain that to me? St. Peter said, oh, yeah, that's easy. The Detroit Lions must have won the Super Bowl. <laughs> we got any Detroit Lions fans in here? None that will admit it. We got one over there. Yeah, I, I, anyhow, that's funny. So we're glad you're here, and uh, you know, I had one guy in the jail that he told me, he goes, you know, God lives in the jail. I said, really? How do you, how do you get that? He goes, every time I come to jail, I find him here. <laughs> I said, yeah, he lives there, all right. So we're happy that you're here. Tonight I'm going to teach you on step number one and the principle called honesty. Every step out of the 12-step program, every step has a corresponding principle. One is honesty, two is hope, three is faith, four is courage, five is integrity, six is willingness, seven is humility, eight is brotherly love, nine is discipline, ten is perseverance, eleven is awareness of God. And step number 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. So I teach the principles. But what are those principles? We practice these principles in all our affairs. I can tell you principles are different than rules. When you, you live a life that's directed by rules, then you run into a rule and you break the rule. How many have ever broken a rule? today. How many broke a rule today? How many broke, how many drove here today? You probably broke a rule. You probably drove faster than this. How many ever drive faster than the speed limit? Okay, this is a, this is a lesson on honesty. Let's try that again. How many ever drive faster than the speed limit? Oh, the rest of you don't have a license apparently. Anyhow, I can tell you that you run into a rule, the rule gets broke, that's it. Sometimes there's a consequence, sometimes there's not. But if you run into a principle, principles do not break, you do. You crash into a principle and that principle will crush your life. And what we did that came into recovery, what we did that lived out in our addiction, we lived a life where we were crashing into life principles over and over. We didn't even know it. And those principles were destructive to our lives. If you break the rules long enough, then you'll find out that you've come up and now you've violated the principle. If you get pulled over for speeding and you get a ticket and you pull over for speeding and get a ticket, if you do that often enough, they take your license away from you. Now you've moved from breaking a rule to breaking running into that principle, and the principle doesn't break, you do. So when we begin to talk about the steps, it's not just about the activity that goes on with the step, it's about those principles that correspond, and every step has that corresponding principle. So as I start off, I want to I want to talk about, uh, I just want to give you a little chunk of something here that will help you. If everyone is equally important, then you really have no great special people and you will not hold your family as a priority. My family is more important to me than just some guy I met over at the Winn-Dixie. Not that I don't love people, not that I don't care about people, but there comes a prioritization where my family, my, my 34 year old son, this last Sunday had a massive coronary, he had the widow maker. 3% of the people that have that heart attack survive. He survived. And uh, so if you think about Stephen, you can pray for him. I can tell you that that got me on full alert. You know, I, life, life doesn't just go on when that kind of thing happens. If everything is important, then nothing is really important. We have to understand that there are things that are important and things that are not important. If every day is the same, then there's never a special day. Then there's never a reason to celebrate. 
God is a God of days of celebration. God has days set aside and, and times and seasons set aside for us to celebrate. They're not all the same. If every event is wonderful, then nothing can ever stand out. And what, what we're talking about is a diminished enjoyment that will need to be adjusted along the way. If everything's wonderful, then you can't have anything that's really, truly wonderful. You know, I, I can tell you that uh, I like to go to Disney with my grandchildren. That's a wonderful experience. That's better than doing funeral number 392. You know, uh, there are differences. Are you all still with me or not? I'm going somewhere. I'm going to take you there in just a second. See, what this, what this is, if there's no losers, they can't have losers, so they can't have winners. You know, if we have winners, then there's going to be losers, and we can't have that. What that's called is neutralization of emotions. And it's taught to our children in the schools. You know, and what we want to do is neutralize all of the emotions. Here's the problem. I should feel the same about everything, according to that standard. If I feel the same about everything, <clears throat> then I will discover that I will feel the same about lying and about telling the truth. I know when I was in my addiction and I was in the throes of that deception, lies felt the same. I could tell a lie and it felt just like telling the truth because I believed it. I believed it on the inside, so for me it wasn't really a lie. To you it might be apparently it was a lie, but for me it wasn't a lie because I believed it. And a truth that's, that a falsehood that's believed to be true will have the same impact as if it were. And so I always believed that, you know, I, I had no, what I had done is neutralized my emotions. We had seared our conscience, the scripture says. And so what happens is everything feels the same. When we enter into addictions recovery, the first thing we have to look at is this thing called honesty. See, what happens when you neutralize and the truth feels the same as a lie, it's an internal justification for our dishonesty. Then we live in the vagaries and the whims and the unpredictable, erratic actions of a, an addictive lifestyle. And in that addictive lifestyle, I've taught you that before, but you get into that addictive lifestyle and it's filled with turmoil and it's filled with confusion and it's filled with dishonesty and it's filled with strife and it's filled with loneliness and it's filled with terror and it's filled with anger and it's filled with fear. That, that lifestyle that you wrapped yourself around with is conducive for growing addiction. It's like a greenhouse effect on addiction. You cannot change who you are and break that cycle of addiction while you live in the middle of that greenhouse that's conducive to growing it. But when we change the external, suddenly we discover that something on the inside begins to change. We begin to feel again. They'll tell you when you first get sober, the good news is you're going to feel again. The bad news is you're going to feel again. You're going to start feeling things. The first thing that clears up when we set down our addiction is our conscience. Suddenly, our conscience comes alive again. We have squashed it. We have pushed it down. We have set it aside. We have neutralized our conscience, and suddenly, now our conscience comes alive, and we will have to work hard in order to do the wrong thing and not feel guilty about it. And a lot of people never really felt guilty about anything. Then they got sober for about a week or two, and now they feel guilty about everything. You know, they're really good if they're Catholic because they go to confession. I mean, it works right out. 2 Corinthians 8.21 says, We take thought beforehand and aim to be honest and absolutely above suspicion, not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. So we have to come to that place of honesty. Honesty is an internal mechanism. Honesty is on the inside. Honesty doesn't begin out here. Honesty begins in here. And I hear people talk about you know, being honest. Well, uh, I'm cash register honest. In other words, you have not even looked at your own stuff. You're just looking at something on the outside. I was cash register honest when I thought I was going to get caught. So, you know, that's no big deal to me. That honesty is an internal thing. If you go back to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says... Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give the cannot. Come on, cannot or will not. Cannot, will not. Cannot indicates that you don't have the ability. Will not indicates you have a bad attitude. It indicates you don't want to. Cannot or will not. 
because there's the, the effect of will. And most of the time, we'll sort that out in a minute. Cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Here they are, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates that are thought they seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Not, not I'm going to take a shot at recovery. Do you know why people don't stay sober? Because they're just trying it out. They haven't decided they want to be sober, so they're not honest about that. They're not honest about the first thing. And so what happens, We don't gra- if you will grasp and you will develop a manner of living, it's where it says, rarely have we seen a person fail who is thoroughly. I can tell you something, in 41 years, never have I seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed the path that I'm walking on. I've never seen anybody fail, but I've seen a lot of people that did half measures that went part way that really didn't commit themselves to this thing. Grasping and developing a manner of living is committing to it. We could do a whole hour on surrender, but that is the point of surrender, where I grasp and develop that manner of living. There are those too who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. Usually, if you're in an AA meeting, there's 12 people that raise their hand right there. Oh, yeah. Well, grave emotional and mental disorders. But many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. If you're constitutionally incapable of being honest, then you need to develop the capacity for honesty. And the capacity comes along. There's a three-parter. We have the capacity to receive sobriety. We have the capacity to receive God's love. We have the capacity to receive from the outside. And then we have the discipline to retain it. We have the authenticity to, to transmit it to others. And that's the whole thing in three steps. But the capacity to receive that, I got to tell you, that's what made honesty work for me. Because when I got sober, I'm going to tell you what, I lied more than I did when I was drinking. Because now I can remember what I was saying, and I figured I could get away with it. Then I wasn't sure what I said. You know, what did I say the last time? I don't know. I don't know. And so I just made something else up. But now it's like I do remember. Now I was lying more than I was then. And it wasn't that I was lying about important things. I was lying about things that were just stupid, that I would lie to total strangers about insignificant things, I guess just to stay in practice. I don't know what I was doing. i just make things up, and I would exaggerate things. How many exaggerated when you first got sober? Oh, yeah. I remember one time I was telling my story early on up in Ohio. I was telling my story, and this old lady came up to me, and I didn't like her. I, I'd seen her around. I didn't like her before. I liked her even less after that. She came up to me, and she said, you know, your story's bad enough. You don't need to add stuff to it. I wanted to hit her. Who do you think you are talking to me that way? Because I, you know, of course, I thought I was above everything. And she was, but she was right. I was still making stuff up. I remember one time I was speaking to, there was about maybe 140 people in this audience. I would tell them my story. You know, and early on, I, I spoke a lot in the first few years. I'd tell my story like almost every week somewhere. And I was telling my story in these 140 people. Now, you got to understand, when you tell your story a lot, you find the things, the things that you describe, the drunk log part, that really is entertaining. That really makes people laugh. And I had some good ones there. Oh, man, I could, and I could polish it up boy and I was just telling this story I was just going away and all of a sudden it dawned on me and I stopped and I said I gotta confess something the story that I'm telling you I don't think it really happened <laughs> I think it's something I dreamt or maybe saw in a movie or something I made up I, I don't think this is the real story and you know they all laughed they thought that was great they thought it was part of the act, I guess. I said, uh, so uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with that. And then I, I said, well, how many want to hear the story anyhow? They said, yeah, they wanted to hear it. They didn't care whether it was true or not. I learned something about AA at that time. They were just as crazy as I was. I, I, I didn't have the capacity. I didn't have the internal mechanism for honesty. I didn't, I didn't have anything to hook it on. The, the, you know, I'm going to teach you about step one in a minute, so don't get nervous. I didn't know where that was going to be at. So I, I just struggle with honesty. I struggle with it. You know, God, help me to be honest. Help me to be honest. I discovered that honesty is not a standalone principle. It requires another principle. Every, every principle that I teach you has corresponding principles or expanded principles. So we start with honesty, but, you know, there's another level of honesty called truth. Everybody say truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, 
the tooth will set you free, but first you not need to identify the specific false beliefs that are holding you hostage. And see, we don't, we don't look at it that way. I went to AA, and there was an assemblage of truth that those people had that I began to assimilate onto the inside of me. I went to church. They had an assemblage of truth that I assimilated. There are groups outside of me that know things that I don't know. When I went to college, they had an assemblage of, of, of facts. I, don't, I won't say it's truth, but they had facts that I assimilated, and, and I got, I don't know if I got smarter or not. I, I, well, I got smarter in one way. I found out they weren't nearly as smart as they thought they were. So that was another subject. I assimilated truth onto the inside of me. And you know what happened? The byproduct was that I became honest. Honesty wasn't something I had to work on after that. I had truth on the inside of me, and out of the truth flowed honesty. I no longer, when I got truth onto the inside, I no longer could justify not telling, telling what was factual and telling what was real. And so I got that truth on the inside of me, and the byproduct was that I became more honest. I wasn't perfect at it, but boy, I improved a lot. And the more truth I got, the more honest I became until I no longer made things up. I no longer felt it necessary to lie. Not even as a pastor. Oh, I'm sorry. I better go over here. Not even as a pastor because there's some pastors that will look right in your eye and lie to you. So, so I thought I'd tell those over there because I wouldn't want these guys to be upset. I can tell you what. I've had more than one pastor look me in the face and lie to me. Just boom. And I'm like. Really, I'm, I'm coming Sunday to hear the rest of that sermon. That'll be good for sure. Because they don't know. They have justified it on the inside. They don't know the false belief that's holding them hostage. You don't have to make anything up. If you don't want to have lunch with me, that's good. Say, I don't want to have lunch with you. I'm cool with that. I didn't want to buy you lunch anyhow. God told me to. And I know you're so tight, you squeak. So I know you're not buying lunch. And I don't really like your company that much. And the wig that you're wearing is ugly. I'm speaking of one pastor in particular, apparently. Uh, anyhow, uh, so I got truth on the inside of me. And I became honest. I became honest in how I presented myself to other people. I became honest in how I presented myself to my family. I became honest on how I presented myself in an AA meeting or at a meeting like this when I'm speaking. So I became honest. Because it was the byproduct of truth. If you operate with honesty long enough, you'll get truth. You'll assimilate truth. If you operate with truth, there's another principle that comes into play. Say, tell me more. Tell me more. There's another principle that comes into play called veracity. Veracity is the love of truth. If, you, if you'll fall in love with truth, I can tell you your life will change a lot. I, I fell in love with the truth. I had a, I had a young guy I was working with that, very close to it, anyhow. I won't go any further with that in that description. But this guy, he decided that when they legalized pot in Oregon, that he was going to go to Oregon and buy him a pickup truck load of pot and bring it and sell it in Florida. You know what I mean. <laughs> and so he did. He went up there and made a connection, and he bought him a whole pickup truck load. He had a cover on the back of his truck, and it was loaded right up to the top. And in, 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 he was coming down through Texas, and he got pulled over. And nearly had a heart attack when that state trooper pulled him over. He was right by the Texas-Louisiana border, and the guy decided to let him go. And so he came on to Florida, and he sold all that pot, and he made a bucket of money. And he thought, this is a very good enterprise, a lot easier than working. So he decided, you know, how many ever had that? That's another whole addiction by itself, that lazy addiction where you're entitled to getting all kind of money without having to work. We call them drug dealers, but I call it an entitlement, and it was a forerunner to many other things we see. Anyhow, he decided to go back to Oregon, and he went to Oregon, and he got another truckload of pot, and he decided now this time, because he got pulled over in Texas, this time he's going to come down and cut across Oklahoma and avoid Texas. And just before he got from Oklahoma over into Arkansas, uh, he got pulled over by a state trooper who was not nearly as forgiven as the boys were in Texas. And he got arrested with that pot. And finally he got bonded out. And he came down to Florida and he got an attorney and they were working on this thing and they finally did a plea bargain. He was facing 30 years in the Oklahoma penitentiary. How many don't think you'd want to do that for vacation? So I was like, oh man. And he was, you know, we're praying for him and all that. And, and so finally I was in prayer for this guy. And I said, 
uh, he, he, you know, he was just terrified of this thing. And I said, here's the deal. Look me in the eye. You have to go to Oklahoma. You're going to have to walk up in front of the judge. And you're going to have to face this thing. And when you do, the grace of God will show up for you. Well, he would have rather that I prophesied something else. But that's what I told him because that's what the Lord put in my heart. And so he went back to Oklahoma and uh, he went to that courthouse. He stayed in the flea, flea bag motel, didn't sleep all night, was terrified. He had to go to court in the morning, his attorney and the public defender. And it was a little podunk town. I mean, it was like a little one horse town, about the size of Titusville up here, just a little place. And, and uh, the judge that was supposed to be there that day to hear this was sick. So they had some fill-in guy that came in, probably his cousin. I don't know how that works in the podunk town. But he came, and he was going to be the judge. So this guy shows up at the court, and him and the judge are there. Nobody else is there. There's a big accident over across the line in Texas, and uh, the guys are coming up from Dallas or somewhere, and they get caught in this traffic jam, and they're hours late. So he sits in this courtroom for hours with this judge drinking coffee, and they were talking and talking and talking, and he shared most of his story and kind of laid his cards on the table. Finally, the attorneys show up. They come up in front of the judge. They both give their side, and then they had worked out a plea bargain where they're going to give him 5 to 15 years as a plea bargain if he'd admit, blah, 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 blah. And so the judge says, Any, anything else? Anybody want to say anything else? And they all said no, and he said, well, fine, but I'm not going to accept this plea bargain. He said, I'm not doing that. And uh, you, you like it or don't like it, but I'm in charge. And then he looked at this guy and he said, one chance in your lifetime, this is it. Go home to Florida, pay your fines, pay the court costs, get off probation, and live your life. Man, that's a, God's grace showed up right there in front of that judge. Surprised everybody. I think even the judge was surprised. And the guy comes back to Florida, and he, and he starts immediately partying and celebrating the fact that he got, to, oh, really? This is not good. He called me up one morning. I said, where are you at? He said, I, I'm behind the bank. I said, what bank? I mean, he, he was sleeping out in the end. I said, really? The guy, it was an amazing thing. When I looked at it, I thought, how unbelievable that you would go back against everything. How unbelievable that you're so confused and you're caught up in so much deception that you would think that that's acceptable. One day he called me up. He had fallen asleep in his car. It was cold outside, and he was slipping his boxer shorts with a blanket wrapped around him, and he decided that he decided that he had to get out of the car and pee. The car was running, and he jumped out of the car to pee, and the door closed, and he was locked out of his car at 3 o'clock in the morning, drunk in his underwear pair of boxer shorts and a blanket so he walked three miles to his girlfriend's house his feet are all bloody and cut up and he's freezing to death he knocks on the door and her husband answered the door you know they, you just can't make this kind of stuff up <laughs> but the guy didn't kill him the guy gave him a ride back to his car you know it's an, it's an amazing thing uh, he's sober now I gotta tell you that, that when we talk about coming coming to this place of being honest and, and falling actually falling in love with the truth he said, what do I got to do? How do I stay sober? I said, fall in love with the AA meetings. You need to fall in love with everything about it. I don't like those meetings. Shut up. Fall in love with it. Well, I, I fall in love with it. If you can fall in love with a girl, you can fall in love with a meeting. You can fall in love. It's just a decision where you're going to sign your love. He fell in love with the meetings on his fifth anniversary. He told me, he said, I'm glad he actually got up in the group and he said, I'm glad that somebody taught me to fall in love with these meetings, fall in love with that truth it's called veracity. Honesty produces truth. Truth produces honesty. They both will produce a love of truth, which is veracity. And if you have that for a while and you love this truth for a while, then you'll come to another principle called loyalty and you will become loyal to that message. I have become loyal to the message of recovery. Oh, I can go preach, I could go pastor a church, I could go do all, but I'm loyal to the message of recovery. And, I, you know, for every time that I speak doing a, a prayer seminar somewhere, I speak five, six times doing the recovery stuff because it's the message. Fall in love with it because you are loyal to your addiction. We were, loyal, we were so loyal to our addiction, and now what we're saying, give up one thing, you get everything back. We gave up everything for one thing, and it's just that simple. Fall in love with this thing and become loyal to it. I am loyal. I am loyal to my sobriety. I'm loyal to that, that truth and, and that thing that God gave me.
So there are two prerequisites. I don't know what I meant. I forget the notes. There are two prerequisites to getting sober, to finding, finding your way in. When we talk about how it works, we, you know, many of them are suffering from grave emotional mental disorders, but many of them do recover the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. If you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then, everybody say then, yeah. you are ready to take certain steps. If you have not decided you want what we have, or you're not ready to go to any length to get it, then you're not ready to take certain steps. If you've decided you want it and you're willing to go to any length to get it, this is about surrender, then you're ready. Otherwise, you're not ready. And you, only you know that. On the inside, you know whether or not you should start these steps. And if you come to me and say, do you think I'm ready to take the steps? I'd say, I think so, or you wouldn't be asking me that question. I, I don't know how else to put it. And so we look at that prerequisites. We, are you ready to take the steps? Some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all earnest in our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil, non-existent until we let go absolutely. Remember, everybody say remember, remember. which is a pretty good indicator that you were about to forget. Remember that we deal with Alcohol, or drugs, or pornography, or gambling, or food, or relationships. Or remember that we deal with, everybody say whatever you're addicted to. Remember that we deal with, yeah, that's correct. Remember that we deal with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. There is one power. Without help, it's too, wait a minute. Cunning, baffling, powerful, progressive, insidious, and fatal. You might want to add those on there. We, we have to understand the depth of this thing. It will kill you. The devil, the devil, you know, wants to kill you. He'll settle for being drunk and crazy, but he wants to kill you. So we come to that place, cunning, baffling, and powerful without help is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. Uh, who? God. God. May you God. Oh, make him up. May you make up something now. Great. <laughs> Just make something up. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, we well, just make something up. We, we don't care what God is. It could be that balloon. Just make it up. Whatever. How insane is that? What kind of meds are you on that makes you think something like that? It could be possibly correct. <sighs> May you find God. We need to locate God. And if you can't locate God, guess who's lost? God's not lost. You are. And there comes a place where I have to, I have to understand that fact. When I'm looking at doing these steps, when I'm looking at doing the thing that's going to heal my life. So let's take a look at the steps. What, what time we got anyhow? We got enough time? Oh, I've got two hours left. Wow. I, I won't even need those notes tonight. So we come to step one. We come down to step number one. I'm just going to jump a little ahead. It's all right. Step number one, we admitted. Everybody say, we admitted. We admitted. I admitted a lot of times. I, I admitted. I admitted while I was sitting in the bar that I had a drinking problem. I thought it was funny. You know, we kind of made, you know, because that's, we, were, we weren't right. You know. I admitted a lot of times, but it never stuck. It never helped me. Not until I came into a room where there was a collective voice. I came into a room where we admitted. We admitted we were, pow I'm getting Height, height up there. It's too high up in the air. I got to come down and look at you to, to really give it to you. I, we admitted we were powerless. We admitted. We admitted. We together came to a place where we, we came to agreement. I came to AA and he said, my name's Fred and I'm an alcoholic and I'm Sally and I'm an alcoholic and I'm Susie and I'm an alcoholic drug addict and, and I'm Willie and I'm a drug addict alcoholic and everybody kind of said something. And it was the first time when I said, I'm an alcoholic. I didn't really believe it, but I just wanted to fit in. You know, I thought, y'all are crazy enough to admit stuff like that. I'll go ahead and admit it, too. I didn't really believe it. 
I admitted that for a long time in front of that group of people. There was a collective voice there. There was a collective voice that challenged my irrational thought. There was a collective voice that said, you know, you need to take a look at this. These people are all serious about this, and you're just still screwing around. Are you an alcoholic or are you not an alcoholic? When I go to a meeting and there's somebody new, I say, your job is to figure out whether you're an alcoholic or not, not whether you should work the steps or you should do that or get a sponsor or even come back. Decide whether you're an alcoholic. I had for me to decide that I was an alcoholic and I was a drug addict and a lot of other things, but at the beginning, they said, quit the addictions in the order they're killing you. And so that was the one that was killing me the fastest, and so I admitted I was an alcoholic, although I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. And I continued to admit that. And finally, one day it dawned on me. As people were talking and they were sharing and they were speaking out, I was hearing something. And when I said I was an alcoholic, I said, wait a minute, but I really am an alcoholic. And they went, yeah, we know. They weren't surprised at all, but it surprised me. I said, but you, you, but you, I really am an alcoholic. You know, would you Wait your turn. <laughs> Enough. You know, they, they, they just looked at me like I was nuts. But it, it, it came alive. It was a collective voice of reason that had finally permeated that wall. There was a wall that I'd put up, and it finally got through the wall in that collective voice of reason. And I said, yeah, I am an alcoholic. Yeah, I do get it. The collective voice of reason is more than just us all saying that. There's a spiritual dynamic that goes behind it. It's called the power of vulnerability. And if you, who I don't know, will become vulnerable in front of me and admit your weakness, and you, who I don't know, will become vulnerable in front of the group and and confess what you, what's going on with you, then what happens is the power of vulnerability kicks into play, and all of a sudden, I can be vulnerable to you because you've been vulnerable to me. It's a collective voice of reason that allows me to break the cycle of self-talk, that internal trap where I couldn't get out, and all of a sudden, you said you were an alcoholic, you said you were this, and you said we were, and it broke through that wall. We admit it is more than just a way to start the steps. We admitted is a collective voice that challenges at the very core our addictive thinking. Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. I needed to confess that. And what, whether you believe in the Bible or you don't believe in the Bible, when I confess, when I do what the Bible says, I get the results that the Bible says. It's an amazing thing. So if you're an atheist or an agnostic or, you know, you believe in tulips or whatever, it's okay. Just do what the Bible says and see what happens. Because God can't lie. And his promises are true. His promises come true. That's why there are millionaires that, are, that, that sing, that are, well, I don't know if it's singing, they're rap. They do whatever that particular genre of uh, noise is. And they do whatever they do, and they're vile, and they're horrible, and they give lots of money away, and it's multiplied back to them because it's God's principle. And we understand that dynamic. This confession, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead and you'll be saved. The same confession principle applies when we're trying to break free from addiction. When you confess it, when you become vulnerable to other people, you enter that collective voice of reason. And not only it frees you, I'm going to tell you the good news is it frees the people that hear you say it. The greater freedom comes. It is the first step in helping another alcoholic. It's the first step in helping another codependent. It's the first step in helping another addicted to a gambling, uh, horrible gambling problem. You've got to understand that when I confess what's going on with me and I become vulnerable, it frees everybody else up in the room. And that's why when we have churches and pastors and leaders that hide and cover their error and cover their, their falsehoods, the truth of the matter is it creates that environment and suddenly everybody's doing that. And I, if, you've, if you don't believe in that, then pastor a church split sometime and you'll find out about it, you know. We admitted, we confess, oh, wait, we, we admitted we were, we were what? Powerless. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, over the effects of alcohol, over the need to use alcohol, over the effects of drugs, over the need to use drugs. We were powerless over this entire thing. We were powerless. 
and our lives have become unmanageable. I got to tell you that we were is a past imperative in the English language. It's also a present imperative, and it's, there's an indication that's a future imperative. I was powerless, I am powerless, and I will continue to be powerless. Well, wait a minute. How can you be powerless if you haven't drank in 41 years? How can you be powerless if you have Christ in you, the hope of glory? How can you be powerless over anything? Well, I can be powerless over anything if I yield myself back to that because whatever you yield yourself to, that becomes your master. And if I'm serving the Lord and walking with the Lord and following the Lord, I've always been a believer. I haven't always been a follower, so I know what that's about. And if I'm doing that, then I won't give myself over to here. See, I was in darkness and God brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light and now I live in the light of Christ I live in the light of that recovery and I don't have to live in the other but if I decide if I to David after 41 years for some reason decide that taking a drink would be a good idea uh, it's not just a physical act that I do it's not just that I, I don't I, all of a sudden I leave this marvelous light and I walk back over, and now I've entered again into the arena of darkness. Does it mean that I'm lost, that I'm no longer saved? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that I have now yielded myself to some other master and not to God. And I can tell you what, it's the first step in destroying your life. It's time to set that down and say, I'm not going back on the other side no matter what. And that, that see, I'm, no, I'm powerless I'm powerless if I ingest alcohol into my system. I know that. I take one drink, man, I light the fire, and I'm off and running. And I forget all about Jesus and my sponsor and the steps and, you know, I'm on my way. Once you take the first one, then you're powerless because you've yielded yourself to the other side. And I come to that place where I'm powerless, powerless over things in, internal. I'm powerless over things external, and I'm powerless over things eternal. The external is the things that I experience. The internal is the things that I think and feel and believe. And the eternal is that which is beyond this life. Powerless over the external, the drugs and the mind-altering chemicals. And I've got to tell you something, just as a sidebar. I won't stay here for more than like 12 minutes. But as a sidebar to that, the mind-altering drugs and chemicals, if you're addicted to that, that includes the chemicals that your brain produces. Because your brain produces chemicals in different times. That's why some people struggle with depression. That's why some people, you know what people struggle with? They, they fall in love and their brain releases chemicals. <laughs> they are stark ravens. They're insane instantly. Have you never been around? How many have fallen in love at some point in your life? You, you're still insane a little bit. I got to tell you, you fall in love and oh, the guy falls in love and suddenly he's spending money that he doesn't have for something he would never think of buying on somebody he doesn't even know her last name. Hasn't met her parents yet. He's, he's banking, bankrupt in the house because he, oh, he's in love. You, are, you ought to be handcuffed to a, a Baptist preacher for a couple of months. I mean, come on. And what happens is our, our brain produces all kinds of chemicals. And here's the deal. People are high when they go back to drugs, even before they get to drugs. You get a crack guy that's decided he's going back to crack. Let me tell you what, you can't control him and you can't talk him out of it. He's already in his mind. The, he's flipped the switch. He's on his way. He knows where he's going and there's no shutting it down. He might as well have already smoked crack. They're high before they get there. And the same with gamblers that are headed to the casino. they got 5000 in their pocket. They're going to the casino. They know they bankrupted their life, but they don't care. Tonight they're going to win. I went to the casino one time in Biloxi, Mississippi, and I spent $10 in quarters on a slot machine, and I won about $8 in quarters, and I just kept playing until the, the $10 was gone. And I concluded for me, it was just about as much fun as taking 10 single dollar bills and burning them in the ashtray at the bar and watching the reaction on people. I was like, I don't get it. However, listen to me. If I'd have dropped a quarter in there and hit a $50,000 jackpot, you'd have never seen me again. I'd have been hooked instantly. There comes a place where I understand that I'm powerless over the external. I'm powerless over people. People, places, things. Their words, their actions, their thoughts, places, including the workplace, including meetings, including the weather. I'm, I'm powerless over taxes and, and vehicle breakdowns and financial reverses. All of the, I'm powerless over elections. 
I'm powerless over wars. I'm powerless over life disappointments. I'm powerless over the IRS. I think I said that once, but they'll tax you twice, so you got to know. You know. <laughs> I'm powerless over the things internal. My thoughts, you know, my thinking, grandiose thinking. I always lived in grandiose thinking or negative thinking. I couldn't find a neutral's groan. I was either going to conquer the world or I wasn't going to go at all. You know, it was crazy. Whatever I yield my thinking, whatever changes my thinking, my initial negative thoughts, I've found out when you're early in sobriety, that first thought is normally wrong. When I got sober, I asked, I said, yeah, nothing was working out. Bonnie, I'm telling you what, nothing was working. I couldn't, I, and so my sponsor, the guy that was working my sponsor, a little Jewish man, Sonny Evans, Sonny said to me, he said, David, I want you to get up in the morning and I want you to make a plan. Can you do that? Can you get up and make a plan? I said, yeah. He goes, make that plan, write it down, and then just do the opposite. You'll be close. <laughs> and he was so right, I had to fire him after that. He was just too right. I mean, it wasn't good. My first thought is usually wrong. The second thought is usually right. I mean, when you first get sober. And the third thought is usually trying to convince myself that the first thought was right. So I have that spinning around. We have power to capture the, that second thought and correct it. The, the quick fix mentality. Uh, you know, I want everything. I want it now. I wanted sobriety right now. I want 20 years of sobriety, and I want it today. You know, how many would like to have 40 years of sobriety? Let me see your hands. Picture yourself 40 years older than you are now. You can have it. I was a young man when I started this, and I'm, I'm not anymore. And, I, I'm, you know, I like being what age I am. It's, it's, it's very cool. You can get by with things you could never get by with as a young guy. Somebody punch you. Now they go, oh, you're just some old guy. You know, oh, he's an old guy. I like that. I'm, hey, I'm just an old guy. What do you want? I don't have to fight anymore. Unhealed emotions, I'm powerless over. What I'm powerless over internal sickness, I'm powerless Powerless over the eternal, all that which is beyond this life, but connected to and affected by this life. My relationship with God, you know, I come on God's terms, not my terms. That's why most people don't find God. They want to come on their own terms. We'll talk about that in step three. My relationship, my relationship to others and my relationship with this material world, all of those things in affect the eternal. Truth is external. Honesty is internal. The results, both of them, is eternal. This life and the life to come. What do I need to be honest about? Everything. And my life, I'm out of time. I know that. I, I know. But admit we were powerless over, and our lives had become unmanageable. Unmanageable. Really. I used to run the Salvation Army. We had 245 beds, addiction and treatment beds. So I had 245 people in beds in treatment. And I had another 100 on mats on the floor. Plus, we'd bring in another 100 homeless every night. We had a really great program. Because the guys that were homeless wanted to get one of those mats in the dorm. And the guys in the dorm wanted to get a bunk. And I, I had a waiting list. I mean, if you, you, and you know what happened to the people that were in the program? I said, don't drop out because you'll be on the floor with the homeless people. And so don't drop out because there's no place to go but, but here. And they would fight for the front row seats. We had 300 people in class every Tuesday night. It was a powerful time, you know. And one of the things I use all the time, I said, when we talk about step number one, I said, and your lives have become unmanageable. How many feel like you're a little unmanageable? And, uh, and I said, so here's the deal. If you live at the Salvation Army, 1400 10th Street, pff, end of story. You don't need to look any further. You've got it. Unmanageability in spades. <laughs> For me, I was unmanageable. I knew that I was unmanageable. My life was, I was, you know, I hadn't made a good decision in years. And my life was so, but it, that didn't keep me sober. I was powerless over alcohol. My life was unmanageable, but it didn't keep me sober. Not until I got to the next place, which is called unbearable. I got sober when life was unbearable. Unmanageable didn't seem to faze me. Sleeping in my car and, and all of that kind of stuff, not knowing what was going to happen the next day. That, that's one dimension of it. But when I got to the place where it was unbearable, I couldn't get sober, I couldn't get drunk, I couldn't get sober enough to straighten things out, and I couldn't get drunk enough to forget that things needed to be straightened out. 
I couldn't get sober and I couldn't get drunk and I, I, I was just, life was horrible. I was alone. I was empty. I was afraid. I was angry. I was, everything was fueled. The emotions were rampant and I couldn't shut anything down and my brain went 100 miles an hour. You know, it's what it takes. It takes what it takes. I remember waking up in my car behind a restaurant not knowing where I was. Not, not just, I didn't know where, I, I didn't know what city I was in. I was sitting in my car, the sun was coming up and I was looking and I was going, I don't know where we're at. And I'm looking down the way and there's a Gaylord store down the way and I don't know what a Gaylord store is. I can't figure it out. I said, what's a Gaylord store? Is that a department store? That's a silly name. Is that a grocery store? Maybe it's a hardware store, Gaylord's. Maybe it's a clothing store. I kept thinking, finally, I couldn't figure it out, so I got a beer out from under the seat, and I opened that beer, and I drank a beer. The sun was coming up, drank a beer. I still didn't know what Gaylord's was. So the beer I had for breakfast wasn't bad, so I had one more for dessert, and I opened another beer, and I drank it. And I don't know what Gaylord's is, but now I don't really care. <laughs> it's like, oh, who cares? And I remember starting my car up, and I don't know where I was and how long I'd been there, how long I'd been gone. And I pulled out from behind the restaurant, and I was a half a block from my house. And I was terrified. I came out of that blackout. I don't know where I'd been. I don't know what I'd been doing. I don't know how I got there, and I don't know. I don't know. It was unbearable. I went home and called my mother. I didn't talk to my mother much. If you know my, his, my story, I didn't talk to my mother. She was a little wild German woman that yelled a lot. I called her up on the phone. In the morning, the sun is coming up. I haven't talked to her in months. I, and she said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm drunk. And she said, well, why in the world are you drunk? And it was my moment of truth. I said, because I'm always drunk. First time I ever really admitted it to anybody. And my mother was true to form. She yelled at me, you know. Like she always did. She yelled and carried on. It was all about her immediately. And then she said, I trained you better than that. We're going to pray. And, blah, blah, blah. and so she prayed. I know she was yelling at God. I know she was yelling at me. She was praying. She was doing something. You know what? I never had a drink since then. God did for me what I couldn't do for myself when I became to the point where it was unbearable. Maybe that's where you're at tonight whatever thing it is that you're wrestling with. When it's unmanageable, look at it because it'll become unbearable if you continue to do it. Bonnie, I'm so glad you're here tonight. You know something, since I started, actually before I went up there, I was looking at you and I thought, Lord, I hope I can say something that helps touch that place in her heart, the place of pain and the place of disappointment, the place of sorrow, the sadness that you brought with you tonight. Nobody said anything to me about you. I don't know. But I've been doing this a long time. And I see something in your heart. And God wants to heal your heart. Just that simple. He wants to heal you. He wants to free you from whatever it is that's just so troubled your life. So good that you're here tonight. Can I pray for you? Yeah. Everybody just... just Hold on, you're not in a hurry. Let me pray for you. Father, I lift up Bonnie right now. And I ask that your spirit would touch her. That your power would come into her life. She's brought all of it here. Let her leave it here tonight. Let her find a place where your peace comes. Step number one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. The principle is called honesty. Welcome to your new life. Oh, thank you. Uh, great message again. 
Uh, well, now is the point where we come to, in, in, our, uh, in our tradition here, it's much like all 12 steps. There's a, you, know, you normally have the chip system. We have a cross system, and Kurt's going to handle that for us tonight. Thank you, Kurt. So if you want to lay something at the foot of the cross, if you want to surrender something, we have something we call a surrender cross. It, it's uh, equivalent to a white chip, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, were using when you walked through the door and you're not now, but it means you are surrendering something to God. So if you would like to surrender something, please come up and get a cross from Stuart. You can carry that around, as I say every time. My tendency in the past was to lay things uh, at the foot of the cross and then pick them up again because somehow I kept thinking I could fix it. This is a great way to carry it around and remember that you have given it to Jesus and that he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light and he will carry it for you and you don't need to do it on your own anymore. So a um, little round of applause for that. So thank you, Lord, for what you do. Uh, Again, if you, if you want that and you want to wait till afterwards, do that. We're going to do a break here. There's a time to have a little smoke break. Uh, Dr. Sutton will be up front, um, and there's some books there. If I didn't mention it before, if you're watching online and uh, you would like to get some of his books and you can't be here in person, answeringaddiction.com, and you can get them that way. Again, there's a retreat coming up uh, April 1st. Just uh, don't go back. Raha means empty-headed. Okay. Sometimes it's a good place to be. There's a good kind of fool. Start with a blank slate and let God fill it in for you, right? So come on out to the retreat and learn how to fill that with good stuff. Uh, come back next week and hear Pastor Stewart uh, on his talk. And then come the week after, and if God is willing, and that's what he continues to lay on my heart, we're going to start digging in each month into the history of AA and how it got to be what it is and the true Christian roots of its founders, all right? And then, of course, the last of this month, we have Tim coming in. He's actually a Salvation Army guy uh, coming in to share his testimony. And we will feed you, I promise you, something good. I don't know what yet, but we're going to provide a meal. Uh, and I thank you all for being here.